But I believe that by overwhelming majority in all the Americas, you and I in the long run, and if it be necessary, you and I will act together to protect, to defend by every means of our command. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast, where we discuss leaders, their decisions, and how they shape the world we live in today. Welcome to another episode of the History in Motion podcast. Today, we set course for the 15th century, a tumultuous era where empires collided and the destiny of a magnificent city hung precariously in the balance. Buckle up as we immerse ourselves in the extraordinary saga of Mehmet II, the formidable Ottoman Sultan and the heart-pounding tale of the fall of Constantinople. In this episode, we're going to venture into the depths of history to explore the vibrant tapestry of a bygone era. Picture the sprawling city of Constantinople, a jewel of the Byzantine Empire, standing as an impregnable fortress for centuries. Yet, as the world evolved and shifted, the city's destiny would ultimately be sealed by the ambitions of one man, Mehmet II, whose unyielding determination and thirst for conquest would set the stage for an epic showdown. The story we're about to unfold is one of immense ambition, unwavering bravery, and the exonerable march of time itself. Prepare to step back in time and experience firsthand the dramatic events that would forever alter the course of history. Welcome to the History in Motion podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the History in Motion podcast, where today we're bringing things to the eastern side of Europe and the western side of Asia to an empire that at its peak was taking up significant territory in two continents with its headquarters at the famous city of Constantinople, or better known today as Istanbul. And it's a it's a fascinating story how one man can kind of have this obsession over this city. And it's not just necessarily one man, but it's an entire world obsessed with this one city that goes all the way back to ancient Rome. And now, Mm -hmm. you know, a thousand plus years later, there's an entire push to take this city and make it part of the Ottoman Empire. So one man had to be bold enough to actually get it done after many, many people had failed. And that's Mehmet II, or better known as Mehmet the Conqueror. So spoiler alert, um, (laughs) uh, the name doesn't give it away on how his conquests of, of Constantinople and parts of the Balkans and other parts of Europe went. But, um, this, I think, is going to be a fascinating one, Richie, because we see the Ottoman versus Christian battle kind of going on and on and on for so long, coming out of the Crusades, and then really going all the way up until World War One. And yep. this is really the peak of that Ottoman power. So I think it's going to be a fascinating one as, as we delve into the kind of the rise of the Ottomans, the fall of the Byzantines, and the absolute kind of pinnacle of Mehmet's life when it comes to taking this city. Yeah, I, I, th- I think with these particular episodes, like they're challenging for a number of respects. One, because, you know, anytime we get outside of like the pre-modern era, like the context is always difficult to kind of pin down, which is, you know, it's it's a it's a part of the value that we get from doing these episodes. But it does make it challenging to kind of provide a context with enough scope that it makes sense to our listeners. And, you know, it's interesting that we'll be talking about the Ottoman Empire at its peak because, you know, we do a lot of episodes episodes on the modern world and World War One, World War Two, and to talk about an empire, you know, one of the most massive empires in world history that, you know, would inevitably be, become like, I think, what it what's the term that historians use, which is, you know, the sick man of Europe, you know, at the curtailing of the First World War and how, you know, the rest of the European powers would divide it. So it provides a very interesting contrast to much of the conversation that happens when we talk to, you know, when we talk to or about like the modern world. Yeah, and it really is this this clashing of worlds, right, as we look at the Islamic world versus the Christian world. And for a very, very oh, long yeah. time, the Ottomans were a massive, massive threat to to the Christian world as You know, it starts with the Crusades and a very fractured Islamic world where, you know, Saladin's able to bring some order there, but then things kind of break apart quickly. But the Ottomans are able to bring that stability and that power to that region where running a crusade into Jerusalem now is 
is a very, very difficult task. And it's actually happening the other way where Ottoman and Muslim forces are starting to move into Christian held land, yep. laying claim to these areas for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you look at Europe today, <clears throat> You will see large Islamic and Muslim pockets, and it's really all due to hundreds of years of Ottoman occupation and the influence of the Ottoman Empire on that space. So it's a kind of like I almost think of just if you almost in my head, I almost have this line, right, where it's like the Ottoman world starts and the Christian world starts and that line just keeps sure. shifting back and forth. But at this point in history, we really start to see it move more and more west. And it's a fear for a lot of the Christian world who's trying to, to figure out how we can hold the Ottomans at bay. But at the same time, there's all the political dealings within Europe where we don't, you don't want to give someone too much power. You want to make sure that it's you who ends up on top. But at the same time, you got to make sure you you don't lose territory to this massive empire that's growing in the East. Yeah, 100%. I think that's such a, yeah, I think, you know, definitely a bit of foreshadowing with some of the themes that people will probably pick up in this episode. But religion underpins, you know, the entirety of this conversation from beginning to end. This is very much a clash, not only of civilizations, but of like religious ideals and wars. Yeah, I've written down here like one of the first things that I was like, I probably should mention this is we talk about the Christian world so much and we're like, remember religion's the most important thing. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, we mention it at length. The Ottoman Empire is no different. In fact, it, it may even be more important in that sense where Islam and, and the Muslim faith is, is everything that happens in that empire. It governs their laws. It governs their religious practices, their culture. Everything is based upon their devout, religious faith and it's really just no different than what we're seeing in the west just you know different different holy book different god all that kind of stuff but at the same time the motivations are really no different at this point this is a religious battle for one piece of this but then it's also the tool of unification that the ottomans are using to bring all of these fractured kingdoms un under their control under exactly. the the control of their muslim faith yeah this whole idea of like expansion and consolidation right is at the epicenter of you know the self Turks and what would ultimately become like the Ottoman Empire that well we're going to talk about today. Yeah, and I think to to maybe kick us off, Richie, it'd be a good idea to kind of give a little bit of an overview on. We have these two worlds, right? And we, we talk yeah. about the Ottomans and, and who they are, and that's one piece. But then the West is it's again it's very different to what we're seeing today. With you know we have the Byzantine Empire, the Hungarian Empire, and we have all the, the Italian city states, which we've talked about in previous episodes. But there again, like you you preface, there's a lot of moving pieces here, and there's a lot to cover. But I think one of the great things about this time period is we do know a lot about a lot of these places, and so mm -hmm. we could go at length and, and talk for hours. But I think, yeah, we'll start with a little bit of an overview on, on where we're at, and then we'll get into Mehmet and, and his life and his eventual conquest of Constantinople. Yeah, I think it's a great way to kick it off. So maybe just to start with a bit of background, and I'll kind of find this with the bookend of like Mehmet's life. So it was, you know, he was on this planet from 1432 to 1481. So we're talking 50 some odd years. It's a world of a lot of dynamic evolution that's happening. There's a lot of political and cultural and technological change. So you know, at it in its broadest sense, if we look at you know what's going on in Europe, you know, up and leading up to 1432, you have the late Middle Ages. We're talking about massive social upheaval. We're talking about the Hundred Years' War between England and France, which is going on from 1337 to 1453, and the early stages of the Renaissance in Italy. You know, in Asia, the Ming dynasties in power in the Americas. Uh, Pre-Columbian civilizations like the Aztecs and Incas are flourishing in the Americas. So, just to kind of level set what's going on across the globe. But if we kind of take it back and point it back towards Europe and we look at the Ottoman Empire, this is really a very interesting period of significant growth and transformation, which would ultimately set the stage for Mehmet's ambitious conquest and his eventual, you know, legendary status as as Mehmet the Conqueror. And I just, you know, a quick comment on that. I'm I hope one day I have a great historical handle like this, because this is I think the, the goal for most of these people at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, we, we've chatted about this before. You had uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent and Mehmet oh, the Conqueror and all these great yeah. names, right? The Iron Chancellor, right? Yeah, like, that's a good one so too. Yeah. But then it goes the other way too. Like we talked about Lorenzo's father <laughs> being Piero the Unfortunate or Piero the Gauti. I can't remember which one was which, but it's, you know, it's it goes both ways or there's, you know, they put the mad after something like that or oh, yes. yeah, I, yeah, Ivan yeah. the Terrible. So yeah, you, you may, you know, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, you, you've got, you've got to earn yes. it, right? Yeah, it could yeah, go the other yeah. way too. <laughs> uh, that's a really good point. Um, okay, so if we're talking about the Ottoman Empire, 
let's we can start with a couple of key phases just to understand the chronological order of how kind of how things transpire. So if we're looking at like the late 13th to the early 15th century, this is kind of like the founding of the Ottoman Empire by Osman the first. It's expanded rapidly by his successors and it really does kind of evolve through the conquests in the Balkans and Anatolia, which, you know, was kind of the initiating point for the empire's, you know, increasing territory and influence. And then in 1402 to 1403 13, there is a bit of a backlash. So there's a major defeat and uh, there's a setback at uh, for the Sultan at the time at the Battle of Ankara in 1402. This ultimately led to a civil war known as the Ottoman Intergenum, which is a, you know, kind of characterized as this very chaotic period of infighting uh, amongst his sons for the throne. And there's a lot of eternal strife and territorial losses. But then, you know, there's a bit of a bounce back with Mehmet II, for, oh, sorry, Mehmet I, 1413 to 1421. This is Mehmet II's grandfather. He was able to kind of emerge victorious and spent his reign kind of sta- stabilizing and consolidating the empire. His focus was on rebuilding the army, restoring order, and kind of reasserting control over the lost territories. And then we can transition to uh, Murad II's reign. So this period runs from 1421 to 1451. So Mehmet II's father, Murad II, continued the work in consolidation and expansion that was laid down by his predecessors. He faced significant challenges, including revolts in the Balkans, threats from the Hungarian kingdom, and the Karamanids in Anatolia. However, despite these challenges, he was able to successfully defend and expand the empire's border, particularly in the Balkans. He also dealt with the growing threat of the Venetians in the Byzantine Empire. But essentially, you know, under his reign, he was able to lay the groundwork for his son, Mehmet II's later conquest. And I guess just kind of cutting across, you know, the chronological order that I just laid out are the technological and military advancements that are happening at this time. So during this, during, during this period, the Ottomans made significant advancements in military technology and organization, which we'll get to later in the episode. They developed a very well-organized military structure, including the Janissaries, which was an elite core of soldiers that would play a crucial role in Mehmet II's conquest. And in terms of like cultural and administrative developments, you know, you, you see this kind of flourishing that's happening with developments in administration, law and culture. And there's this kind of increasing synthesis of diverse cultural influences for many regions under Ottoman control, which would support the empire's continuation of this kind of rich and multifaceted character that would kind of define the empire as it not only grew, but consolidated its power across these territories. Yeah. And I think there's trade is getting to another level at this mm-hmm. point as well that we really haven't seen before with if we look at kind of a map of of the world here at this point or at least of europe you know we have the ottomans in around what we would consider today turkey and into the middle east and then moving mm-hmm. up kind of into the greek city states and to bulgaria and, and those places but kind of right by constantinople you have Crimea, where for years has kind of been this hotbed of the slave trade for many many years and the Italian city-states have been very, very good at building colonies along these these areas to kind of help with trade. You know, we have a lot of the Italian banking systems kind of growing and those sort yep. of things. So we're starting to see a little bit of this, I guess, more international type of trade and industry and economy really for the first time it's you may have been only able to trade with your neighbors or to you know people within your community but now it's expanding where the ottomans can theoretically trade with the spanish because we have all the technological changes from a social perspective and understanding how finances work but also the naval uh, movements for you know larger ships that can carry larger cargo and go faster and go for a longer period of time turning the mediterranean into this trade kind of hot spot where things are moving around all the time and it makes a bit of a hotbed but it also allows for places like the ottomans or other empires to be able to grow and maintain their control a little bit better because you can get messages around quicker you can move troops quicker then also you can keep the money flowing which is key right if you're a small island that hasn't seen you know a ship in in months or in years and isn't able to get their goods on and off, you know, their their shores, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to be looking up to your, you know, overlord, whether it's the Ottomans as someone that you respect and is helping you grow. It'd be maybe somebody out of fear and, 
you know, that never can, that always is going to lead to some sort of challenges for when you're trying to keep control of these, these territories. So it is kind of a, a good time. And I think to your point of Ottomans were going through some civil war and now things are kind of stabilizing. I think it goes to your point of the technological changes plus the social changes all coming together are kind of setting the seed for the Ottomans to really flourish at this time and for the next few centuries to come. Uh, that's a great point, Paul. I think like in, in via the lens of like commerce and, you know, economic value and the strategic value of expansion and consolidation, obviously the, the, the wider the empire spreads, the more resources that are available, the more trade routes they have um, available to them to kind of maximize the value of how their, their commerce and, you know, economy me is kind of flourishing. And I think that really is a great segue to Constantinople, which is the very much this very strategically valuable city. Most of my research focused on kind of like the religious symbolism behind it and the historical relevance of how important the city was, but it doesn't discount the strategic importance just from, you know, being able to provide an inlet and an outlet for trade and commerce. So if we're looking at Constantinople, really, again, to your point, Paul, it's it's situated, you know, at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, right? It's kind of this connector in many ways, and it holds immense strategic and cultural significance throughout history. So it's founded by the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, another great handle in 330 AD. It's, you know, it served as the capital of the the Byzantine Empire for about a millennia, earning the moniker the Queen of Cities. And before we get any deeper on this, I just want to maybe drop a quick note to our listeners about, you know, what exactly is the Byzantine Empire? Because it's a, it's a bit of a historical oddity in many ways, because, you know, the empire is like a direct continuation of the Roman Empire's eastern half. It's a bastion of Christian civilization. It's a bridge between the ancient and the medieval worlds. Again, it's founded in 330 AD and was christened Constantinople. It is now modern day Istanbul as the capital of the empire. And it was a melting pot of Greek, Roman and Christian traditions. It was known for its legal systems. It had a rich cultural legacy in art and architecture, economically prosperous and obviously very strategically located. You know, it was a crown jewel city. It controlled vital trade routes and embodied thousands of years of history. Uh, by the time Mehmet II set his eyes on in 1453, the city wasn't just a strategic prize, but a this symbol of historical and cultural magnitude. And, you know, I think that's it's very important to know because one, it goes to showcase that it does have this kind of Roman legacy attached to it on the eastern half. And, you know, it's it's extremely important strategically. You know, we have the Bosporus Strait, which cuts between Europe and Asia. It controls those vital trade routes. There is significant cultural and religious symbolism here. To your point, Paul, you can't deny the importance of religion in, in this episode or in many of our episodes, but I think this one in particular. And it has become this political and economic center, you know, acting as a gateway between the East and the West, which allows, you know, whoever is in power to really have one significant influence and then two, amass extreme wealth. Yeah, and just to even go back to your point about, you know, the this being eastern half of the Roman Empire, the Byzantines are as more of a, I wouldn't say necessarily modern term, but a more recent term for what they were called. They called themselves the Romans up to yep. the point of Constantinople falling. And when we talk about you know, the fall of the Roman Empire in 400 and something AD, that's just the western half of the empire. The eastern half continues on as the Byzantine Empire all the way up to this point. So there's an extra thousand years of, we're going to call it Ro Eastern Roman history um, <laughs> that kind of gets kind of put into the Byzantine kind of era just as a a way to separate kind of those two eras but these people still consider themselves very much as roman and so you know the legacy of the roman empire is just so dominant throughout europe and the fact that constantinople is also seen as it was the capital city and according to the people who live there it still is the capital city of the roman empire for that to fall on top of you know all the religious elements there's also a great historical I guess, piece to all of this where the if the Ottomans are able to take the capital of the Roman Empire, that's, you know, something that's going to go down in the history books, which it clearly does. But it's just kind of another layer that gets added on to this great city and why it's so important to the whole world. Yeah, it's such a great point. And I think just to layer in some additional context is that, you know, you have the Byzantine Empire at this time and leading up to the actual, you know, fall of Constantinople, um, the empire is becoming, you know, increasingly weakened. And there is a lack of trust in the papacy. England and France have been going at it for over 100 years, right? there. The, the Europe at this point is, obviously, religion is very important 
important, but at the same time, you know, because the papacy is growing so significantly with their power and influence, there's a bit of distrust that is kind of forming and bubbling up across these major European powers in England, France, and even Spain, where, you know, they're kind of looking a bit more critically at the papacy. And insofar that the Byzantine Empire is, you know, um, as a byproduct of that is is kind of in a period of decline leading up to the, the fall. For sure. And there's even another element to that of if you know anything about kind of Christian religion today, you have people who are from Eastern Europe, typically are Orthodox Catholic. And that break happens before we even get to this point where the Pope actually sends a crusade, not into Muslim territory, but to actually sack Constantinople, I think in the 1300s. So there's this yep. animosity between, you know, the Christian, again, we say the Christian world versus the Muslim world. But even to say the Christian world is, is far too simplistic. We do have a divide in this world where the people of Constantinople don't necessarily have any faith in what the Pope is saying in Rome. And to be able to rely on Western Europe for resources, supplies, support, it's not as guaranteed as we might think as listeners might be saying, well, okay, well, the Ottomans are invading this great city. Why didn't all of Europe rally behind them and, yep. and shut this down? There's a little bit of, like you were saying, there's all this like interfracturing between exactly. this Christ, quote, you know, air quotes, Christian world. You know, it's just not as simple as, you know, we sometimes like to make it out to be, but there is a point where people can rally behind the fact that Muslims, bad Christians, good versus Muslims, bad Christians are good, but that only yeah. work takes it so far and until the additional levels of fracturing, um, start to rear their head. I think it's important to keep in mind, like before we, you know, obviously we'll talk a bit about Mehmet before we get into the siege. But if we think about, you know, Constantinople, this, you know, fortress of a city that's been around for thousands of years, it has these massive walls, it's been under attack before countless times. I think you just mentioned it, but the city fell for the first significant time in 1204 during the Fourth Crusade, which was a brutal sacking of the city. So they're no strangers to, uh, you know, being attacked and under threat of of enemy penetration. I think, you know, that just kind of layers in this additional complexity and historical interest and intrigue around the mystique of Constantinople and this this fortress city, which has been able, you know, to remain standing for, you know, the better part of a millennium, which is really, you know, amazing. Funny, because we think about timelines, and we think back, you know, if we think back to World War Two, it was long ago, but not that long ago, or we think back to the Napoleonic sure. Wars, and that seems like forever ago. And even this period seems like something that we can't even fathom. But to your point, this has been around for a thousand years, the you know, it's an empire that's still that's if you count the Eastern Roman Empire, that's over 2000 years it's that it's been around, <laughs> which think of basically the birth of Jesus all the way to now. And we're talking about that time period that this empire has been around for, which is an unbelievable. It's like all of, you know, history for a lot of people that kind of think about it in that in the post ancient world, I guess, is all kind of mixed into to that time period. So. Yeah, for it to be able to exist for so long needs to have, obviously, it's strategically placed at a very, very good point. It has an incredible series of walls and moats and just all these defensive fortifications. Exactly. Yep, yep. It's It's got a naval side. It's got the land side. They're, they're able to... If there's a reason it hasn't been taken, but also the fact that it's so important, you think somebody would have taken it by this point. But, you know, here we are, it's still under Byzantine control and, you know, someone's looking to come across and, and make that change. Yeah. And I think this is where, you know, inevitably, as we know, this is where the conquest of it would happen, but it would take the right leader at the right time. And I think, you know, Mehmet II is a very interesting character where, you know, under his lead, they were able to strategically do this. But uh, Paul, this might be a good time to hand it over to you to kind of introduce our main figure today. The way you kind of prefaced it was perfect because it's going to take the right person who's brash and bold and maybe a little bit crazy sure. to kind of make this attempt. But he's also going to need to have the proper technology. He's going to need to have the proper people around him to do all of these things, where if it was 100 years earlier, I'm not sure if you would have had that opportunity to do so. But let's let's introduce him and, and kind of talk a little bit about how he even gets to a point where he can send a large army to Constantinople. So Mehmet II was born on March 30th, 1432, in the city of Irdirne, which is the capital city of the Ottoman state, which is still a city in Turkey today. Um, his father, Murad II, and his mother was named Uma Hatun of, we don't know for sure where she's from, but we believe she was a slave of some type. So... This is a little bit different in the Ottoman world where we've talked about in at least in the Western world a little bit more where if you were not born to a, another noble woman, you were typically considered illegitimate. There's 
it's not exactly like that in the Ottoman world where sultans would have many, many sons um, and they didn't necessarily have to be born between two nobles. But, you know, there's always a little bit of depending on who, who's ta- who's talking and who's trying to define the narrative that can change a little bit. But unfortunately for Mehmet, his birth mother dies when he's a very young boy. So his father remarries to someone named Mara Brokovic, who is a Serbian noble lady. And she ends up taking a crucial role in his life. She essentially becomes a key advisor to him, a mother figure for him, of course. But she also has really great connections in the Greek world and in the Balkans. So she's able to be this diplomat for him when he needs some support from the Balkan world. He can send her on on missions and she's very, very well respected. And she's able to kind of work those dealings for him while he's off campaigning or trying to mop things up in Turkey. She can help kind of keep the Western world at bay a little bit, which is huge for him because if he's trying to just keep order within Turkey, he needs someone who who can jump in and, and kind of keep the West at bay. But also, you know, he's lost his mother to have someone who's, you know, his stepmother come in and take that role for someone he can really respect and think is is very, very important for him as he moves along. And having someone who you can trust unconditionally, especially at this point in history, is invaluable at that point. So at the age of 12, he's sent, which was kind of a traditional thing in the Ottoman world, to Manisa, which was a province. And he was basically told, you're now the governor of this place. So some 12-year-old rolls in and he's told to govern. It's not a huge place, but it's still a place nonetheless that he needs to govern. So he's given tutors, he's given people to help him out. But the whole idea was, look, you're going to be sultan probably in the next 10 years at some point. We need to get you ready. We need you to understand how to how to administrate and understand how the legal system works and all these sort of things. So when you become sultan, you're not just you know, thrown into the fire. But part of this too is his, he's being taught a traditional Islamic education and it has a great impact on molding Mehmet's mindset and really reinforcing his Muslim beliefs. So like we talked about, religion is so, so important, but in this case, he takes it on as, you know, definitely an identity for him. And and he takes it to something that, you know, kind of is going to influence a lot of the decisions he makes um, going forward. So as he's going through this, his father Murad II makes peace with Hungary on June 12th, 1444. And he actually abdicates the throne in favor of Mehmet II. So Mehmet is only 12 years old at this point. He's a boy. And I kind of wondered, like, why would he do this? And so you had mentioned it earlier, Richie, where there was a bunch of civil wars going on in the Ottoman world, brothers fighting against each other. If you if there's one stereotype about the Ottoman Empire, it's that anytime there's succession, there's some sort of fight that's going on. Sure. There's some sort of brothers fighting it out about certain things. And we'll get into how Mehmet wants to deal with that. So a lot of historians say, well, Murad knew that Mehmet was probably not ready. He's such he's still a boy. But if he can put him in charge before he dies, this will help to consolidate his power over uh, or Mehmet's power over the Ottoman world as Murad can still use his influence, where if he dies, it could just turn into total chaos where a bunch of people are trying to fight for the throne and he wants to establish that before he dies. So he sees the um, experience and prestige kind of as this, I guess it's a guarantee for him that there's going to be this peaceful transition of power. So initially, the Ottoman succession practice was based on this Turkish and Mongol tradition at the time, which involved lateral succession among sons of the rulers. And so this, like I said, often led to conflicts, and it was just something that was kind of prolonged and, and very destabilizing. So it's funny to a common tactic that the Byzantines would have used was they would offer asylum to someone who lost the battle for succession and then release them into the Ottoman Empire whenever they wanted to stir up trouble. So say, for example, the Ottomans were getting really <laughs> strong. They would say, oh, yeah, here's your uncle. He's now back in the fold, and we've given him a bunch of money to raise an army, and that'll keep the Ottomans um, at bay for a while. And so the fact that the Byzantines always have one or two guys that they can just release into the Ottoman world and create a bunch of chaos, I think just goes to show that um, (laughs) there's not the stability yeah, that you would expect. So during his reign, his first reign, I should say, which again, the first reign, not the second reign, (laughs) um, he had a few different crises that he had to deal with. So the King of Hungary, the Pope, the Byzantine empires and Venice were all eager to take advantage of the ascension of essentially a child to the Ottoman throne. So they started organizing a crusade. So in September 1444, an army of crusaders crossed the Danube River and laid siege to the city of Vara, Ottoman-controlled city in modern-day Bulgaria. When the Crusaders laid siege to Varna, the the reigning sultan's father was urged to come back from retirement and lead the army. So Murad is now back in charge. Mehmet has been pushed aside because this is a crisis and we need someone with a lot of experience. And so Murad is able to put an end to the crisis 
win the battle for the the Ottomans and essentially now remain as Sultan um, until the day he dies. So Mehmet kind of was always still given the title of Sultan, but really the power lied with Murad. And then eventually Murad dies and, and Mehmet's able to take the throne. So, you know, this is again, another hotbed of what's going to happen here. Is there going to be some sort of civil war? Is somebody going to push for power? Um, it doesn't happen right away. But what happens is Mehmet is now in a point where he needs to do something. He needs to be able to say, how can I control and get my legitimacy? That's not just, oh, it's my father who was so great. I need to do something myself. And his first thing is to have eyes on Constantinople. He sees it as this trophy that he can essentially say, if I can take this city, no one's going to question my legitimacy. And it's going to be a way for him to bring great honor, but also stability to his reign and to the entire empire. And how old is he at this point? I believe he's like 20 or 21. So he's still quite young. He's been involved right a lot within this world. But, you know, we've talked about you know, young rulers coming in and, and trying to <laughs> trying to take over. It sometimes doesn't go very well, but for and we'll see it a little bit with his temperament that you can definitely see a, a young kind of fiery man trying to take over and, and maybe isn't as level headed as his father would be in certain situations. I'm just picturing a twelve year old governing in my head and there is a bit of comedy um to that image of sending like this young sultan to prepare him at the tender age of 12 to figure out how to, how to rule over people uh, what a what a practice that is and obviously formative because you know obviously he was quite successful you know and history has been kind to him in many respects in terms of his legacy but you know i think it's just you know a very early example of some of what we would see as his leadership skills and you know tactics kind of come come through later in life yeah it's it's one of those things too where you're you're given from a young age essentially you're treated like a god from the time you're born where everybody is groveling Mm -hmm. to you and telling you how great you are but he also has good people around him murad is definitely not a you know take it easy kind of father who praises his son over everything he's quite tough on his son he Again, he takes the throne back from him, which he he easily could have said, oh, no, Mehmet's the best. He'll be able to figure this out. He understands the situation and he's able to take it back and kind of keep the peace while doing so. He has his stepmother, Mara Brokovich, who's who's giving him a lot of advice and is essentially a great advisor to him. And then he has all of his father's aides as well, who the challenge here could be, does he throw them to the side and put his own people in charge? Or does he do kind of a mix of bringing some of his own people Mm -hmm. and keep some of his father's people? And that's what he does. Because A, you need to have people that you can trust unconditionally, but you also have people with 30, 40 years of experience how to run an empire. And those people are invaluable in, in anything that he could do. So he's got kind of this pretty good cast of people around him. He seems like he has some sort of stability. He now wants to take Constantinople, which was definitely not a popular decision. The, like you had mentioned before, the Byzantines are kind of weak at this point. It's really just the city of Constantinople and a few little areas around there. Um, it's essentially a city state now that the empire has shrunk significantly and it's not really a threat to the way it used to be. But it is that marker of power and that marker of glory and that way to say, you know, to really put yourself in the history books. And it's really the reason we're talking about him today and not, you know, some other um, Ottoman ruler. So the Ottomans had tried to take the city many, many times times tried they've gone from full sieges they've gone from little blockades to try and just weaken the city even murad ii had a siege in 1420 uh, 1422 but was unsuccessful so again there's this thing with Mehmed where if he can accomplish what his father was unable to do it bring a lot of glory to him and it just became this obsession so Mm -hmm. he didn't just become you know a household name you know throughout europe in the middle east but what are you going to do overthrow the guy that took constantinople and, and something that nobody could have done for thousands of years talk about a way of really consolidating your power and putting a stamp on on what you kind of did and it reminds me of last week when we were talking about uh, otto von bismarck when he got shot like five times and just walk, <laughs> kept walking down the street right it, it just brings this kind of aura to you of this great yep. person who just can't be stopped so to challenge this person it almost seems like a bit of a, fo- a fool's gambit well yeah like it's it's a great thing to put your hat on at the end of the day right like i'm the leader that took down the impregnable city that no one else has been able to take down over a millennia um no small feat as we'll see <laughs> historically speaking but you know i think strategically he sees the the value and you know this uh, uh, you know symbolism is a funny thing right i think like historically at least from my experience historians you know somewhat try to stay away from symbols because it can get really fluffy and you can't really do a lot of like historical analysis about it but in many circumstances you know the power of a symbol can be 
in many ways, like a rallying cry for people. If we look at like, you know, our episode of Joan of Arc, that, that is an episode teeming with the importance of symbolism here. And I think in many respects, if we're looking at Constantinople and how, you know, Mehmet, it's kind of laser focused on taking on taking the city. You know, I, I think he's keenly aware of, you know, what this would symbolize, not only for him as the leader, but what it would mean for the empire and, you know, uh, the Ottomans as a whole. Absolutely. And I think even not even a symbol for him, but for some for the Christian world too, to say oh, yeah, yeah. there's this new new kid on the block who literally was a kid for a long time, and you guys tried to invade because you thought you could you know push over this small little sultan who's just a boy. Now this boy has taken this massive symbol of the Christian world, and when it comes to negotiations and it comes to hey, should we launch a crusade against him? Mm, probably not. He seems like he knows what he's doing. There's mm-hmm. a piece now where he's kind of got everybody starting to think differently about who he is and now he's going to be on the front foot and start being able to take you know the territories that he wants and the power that he wants. But before he does any of that, he still needs to take Constantinople. That's still the first piece. When we talked about, I believe actually he was, I think he was like 18 or 19 when he took the throne and then was 21 when he marched on, on Constantinople. So it's, again, is he some young man slash boy who's like, let's just go. We'll just march and, and go get it. He takes years building and up planning. Yep. and planning and, and understanding the, the political context of what he's trying to do. So some of the first things he does is he needs to secure his power domestically and internationally. So he begins by securing the loyalty of the grand viziers and the other viziers within the empire. So these are noble men who are administrators or leading parts of the government or having some sort of um, advisory role within the military. And many of these men were loyal to his father. So he's able to secure their loyalty and then replace those that are kind of seen as problematic. He looks to Venice and Hungary, which are historical enemies of the Ottomans, and he's able to sign peace treaties with them so they kind of saw him as this weak sultan who they're like great you know we don't have to worry about him sure we'll sign some peace treaties but he's able to kind of keep them at bay so now he's got some he's done some mopping up in in turkey to kind of keep things a little bit more secure internationally he doesn't have to worry as much about christian response to his invasion so he's kind of got that figured out but now he needs to build the ottoman war machine so the first thing that he does is he goes into the bosphorus which is this stretch of uh, ocean or sea i guess that connects the black sea to i guess to the aegean sea and Mm -hmm. then into the mediterranean but it's a key point of of trade that comes through um this kind of europe and asia crossroads and he sets up a massive fortress there and he uses it as a, uses it as a blockade from supplies that are moving into Constantinople from their Byzantine allies in the Black Sea. And he also expands the navy as well. So he starts to take control of some of these key um, naval points and trade points. He also reforms the Ottoman military with a focus on getting the most out of his Janissaries. So the Janissaries are these legendary Ottoman soldiers. So they're the first, what we would consider modern standing army. So when we say standing army, you know, it's, it's, that's typically how we see an army today. You have professional soldiers, so, you know, you, you join the army. This is what you do. You go through training, you're paid a salary, that kind of stuff. Where in, throughout history, we don't see a lot of standing armies until we get to these larger empires. Typically mm-hmm. it's reservist forces where, you know, they're farmers and blacksmiths and all of these things. And they get called up to the military and then armed or they're conscripts of some capacity. This is a professional force who's training every day, who's being paid by the government to be soldiers. And that's just what they do. So they're one of the most one of the finest infantry infantry forces um, in the world. And they're also one of the first to be equipped with firearms, which is, again, starting to, we'll get into more about the firearms and why that's so important with the Ottomans. So thinking it was just little like hand rifles and stuff like that, that don't do too much damage, but they do provide a little bit of a flavor to the type of warfare that we're seeing. And there's another wrinkling to these Janissaries that's really interesting is these soldiers are not actually, you know, we'll say quote unquote Ottoman in the traditional sense. They're actually children that were taken from Christian families in Ottoman land or through raids, forced to convert to Islam as young boys and then train from a young age to become professional soldiers. On top of that, they're forbidden to marry until the age of four or engage in any trade their complete loyalty is to be is to the sultan and that's it so this is you've taken these young boys trained them for their whole lives and basically said you can't do anything else other than fight for the sultan but it almost became such a prestigious thing 
where you even see stories of Ottoman people who, I guess, to back up, the Ottoman people were not allowed to actually become Janissaries. You had to go through this. You literally had to be a kidnapped Christian boy to be able to be a Janissary. <laughs> but Ottoman families would start to pay bribes to get their kids into the Janissary program because wow. it was such an honorable thing. And eventually throughout time, this began to change a little bit. But at this time, these are just boys that were kidnapped and told... You know, you are now fighting for the Sultan and they became a very, very effective force. So he's really making sure that he's got the loyalty of the Janissaries and he's got them equipped and ready and trained um, to the point where they can be really, really effective uh, against the Christian and Byzantine forces. That's incredible. I knew a little bit about the Janissaries, but I didn't know that wrinkle of detail. Um, it, it's funny that people would want to pay for their kids to do that, but it's not as funny when I think about what modern parents do for their kids today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, it's anything of, you know, your kids... Your kid's sitting on the couch and not doing something. You, you want him to join the military. And in this case, you want him to be like, you know, this is like the Marines or, you know, the elite forces of, of the Ottomans. So, yeah. And again, back then, we know how strong military tradition is that being exactly. part, you know, being winning glory on the battlefield is yep. the most important thing that you can do. Just before we get to Constantinople, though, there's one last thing. And Richie, we talked about it already. And this is the most probably exciting part of the Ottomans is cannons. We yes. have we are seeing this huge technological innovation in cannon technology where, you know, there's small little cannons that are being used at this time, but the Ottomans take it, you know, to the to this degree that we've never seen before. So just to preface, these aren't the cannons like you'd see in, you know, the Civil War, American Civil War, the Napoleonic War with, you know, the two wheels and they're wheeling it up and they got like a big row of them. They're not small and nimble like that. These are massive, massive cannons that are essentially hauled to the battlefield, kind of set up and then fired continuously from a stationary spot. And I think, Richie, you had some stats on the absolute size of these things because it you got to give us some numbers here because it's yeah it's I, unbelievably large how how crazy big these things are. I, I would um, urge everyone to go to Google and Google the Ottoman cannon or the basilic to just get a sense of the sheer size, just to begin to understand the damage that these things could do. So maybe before we get into that, a little precursor into the technology that will like maybe a bit of for foreshadowing you know the success that we'd see with the ottomans and with the fall of constantinople was the basilic cannon which i just told everyone to go google which was created by the hungarian engineer urban we don't really know too much about this guy but um essentially what we do know is that he offered this technology um to emperor constantine but because of the cost he said no he went to the ottomans he went to mehmet mehmet saw the value signed up for it and the rest as we know is history but on the cannon itself so this thing is 24 feet long two and a half feet wide apparently and i will need to fact check this because i've seen a few ranges that it can handle cannonballs anywhere from 600 to 1200 pounds with a range of over one mile i'm gonna let that sink in because yeah. those numbers are nothing short of insane and we're talking about the mid 1400s and when you think of sieges right i'm trying to think of before this time it's siege towers sappers digging under the walls catapults trebuchets yeah, yeah yeah you know throwing rocks not blasting cannonballs at these <laughs> massive walls and again if you're going to take down the walls of constantinople you're going to need some modern firepower and boy did they ever have it you know to be and to be able to launch something a mile you're essentially out of range of any defenders at this point because they don't have that yeah. technology so you can just sit back and fire these things day and night which is exactly what they did but you know they had to worry about this is a primitive technology in the sense of cannons exactly. are blowing up in their yeah. faces yeah, all yeah, the yeah. time and they're not able to fire them as frequently as they would like due to heat and cracks building and these things that they always needed to keep in mind but my goodness the, i think the range is what's got me to be able to fire something that large over that range it's a transformative technology that's you know probably the main reason Mehmet's able to be as successful as he was just and even like the sheer size of the cannonball even if we go with the low bar of 600 pounds <laughs> that is such an incredibly large cannon and then with the potential of launching something over a mile that could get up to 1200 pounds the sheer damage that thing could do is incredible and I guess to your point, Paul, like these are huge, huge, huge.
huge cannons that weigh i i couldn't uh, thousands of pounds maybe right at like, least yeah loaded loaded thousands of pounds so you know and again primitive technology so not everything is going to work out perfectly there's going to be technology flaws and breaks and things that happen but just like to move these the ranges that i heard when i was doing my research was that 60 to 90 oxen to pull one cannon along with a force of 30 or 40 soldiers to be able to actually move manage and position these cannons in a way to attack strategic well it makes sense why they're so powerful but you can see why not many other people had this at the time just a the manpower and the ox power to just move these things let alone build them and maintain them which they were kind of i wouldn't say single use but single battle single siege and afterwards a lot of times you'd see these cannons get retired because they were just so worn out from all the firing that they did but you know Let's think of Constantinople and day and night, you're just getting bombarded with these massive cannons who are, you know, just kind of taking shots at your walls. And one of the interesting things that the the Byzantines did was as the Ottomans started to knock down their walls with their cannons, what they did was they started filling in the gaps with like a mud slash kind of a softer substance, which actually made the cannons not ineffective, but much less effective instead of Think of a cannonball hitting a brick wall versus hitting a pile of mud. It's going to do a lot more damage to the brick wall, but the mud's going to kind of absorb a lot of that impact. So it was kind of a clever tactic by the Byzantines to say, all right, you got these cannons. You know, we're going to have a um, a little bit of a softer wall that you're not going to be able to break through. And if you ever look at even like Civil War forts and stuff like that, they all have big slopes in them because cannons are so powerful that now if you're shooting off... You don't want to be shooting into a 90 degree angle. If you're hitting a 45 degree angle, it's doing a lot less damage. So yeah, yep. exactly. So yeah, you can start to see already quickly how defenders are adapting to new technology. And it's essentially sort of, of an arms race in, in that sense. But that's kind of how this battle starts is the Ottomans roll up and, and they just start blasting the walls with these massive cannons trying to find some way to break into the city. And maybe just a point on like the numbers of, of, of soldiers and infantry we're seeing here. So in terms of the defending forces with the, the Byzantine Empire and some of their allies, which, you know, actually didn't seem to amount to much. I think it was a force of like a couple, maybe a thousand or so that came when um, uh, Emperor Constantine went to the papacy and the papal states for some support. Um, Estimates suggest there were about 7,000 to 10,000 defenders, including both regular troops and civilian volunteers. Um, It did include uh, like a small contingent of foreign fighters, but um, most notably from Genoa and Venice. It's a Justiniani, I think, right? Was the the Genoese guy. Yeah. So there's, he's kind of the one who's leading that defense fence because he has a lot of known as a, a great defender of, of sieges but again he's bringing a handful of troops at his own expense this isn't like the pope is sending 20 30 000 men to to kind of help support this this is just a handful of troops and supplies that are coming to stop this massive ottoman army yeah and the massiveness is is like the scale of it is quite remarkable so the ottoman forces were much much larger we're talking you know estimates from 50 to 80 000 soldiers so eight to ten times the size of what the Byzantines wow. are working with at this point. And obviously they have like a diverse range of troops. You know, we talked about the Janissaries. We talked about uh, regular infantry, cavalry, and the various support units, not to mention the these massive cannons that are just bombarding the uh, Andalusian walls constantly. Yeah, and it's... But the thing that I find interesting about this is you have these massive cannons and they just can't seem to break through. I think the siege goes on for months where the Ottomans, I read something that the Ottomans didn't like sieges. They wanted quick wins. They didn't like to sit and and wait. And for someone like Mehmet, this is a big challenge, right? Because he's known for being, he's telling people what he wants. He's not taking no for an answer. He wants things done. So he's pushing a lot of pressure onto his troops and to his generals to get these things done. But at some point he has to find that balance between how do I keep these soldiers happy? versus how do I get the job done? So it's definitely a big test for him at this point, let alone taking the city, but also how do you keep your troops happy? How do you keep morale high as you know, you're know you pounding these walls and you just can't get through and people starting to think, are we ever going to get into this city? Is this Are we just going to end up going home in shame? And you know it's probably the end of Mehmet if he's not able to, to take the city. And is that going to mean a civil war and all these sort of things? So I'm sure there's a lot of things going through a lot of people's heads as the walls continue to stay up and they won't go down. Yeah. And I think, you know, you can only take bombardment for so long. So you have this city that's encircled by 80,000 soldiers. It is getting bombarded constantly 
constantly. They, I believe, have total naval control at this point. Like I think it was like four to one for every ship that the Byzantines had. Um, the Ottomans had four. Um, so in ter- like they are just outnumbered in every way, shape and form at this point in time. And the siege continues to unfold in this way, right? That you have to hunker down. And it's a in many ways like a, a practice and patience to be able to just hold out longer than your enemy. Yeah, and that's the classic thing with sieges, right? It's it's not necessarily the the army that's going to win it. It's the sanity of the people. The food is going to run out. The guess, stability within the sieging forces or the besieged forces, some sort of breakdown happening that's that's going to cause an opening and, and someone's going to end up winning. So yeah, this this siege goes on for a while, but ultimately Mehmet's able to be successful. And there's some some different kind of crazy things that happens. Like there's even a point where the across the harbor of Constantinople, they would put this big chain up and it would essentially be mm-hmm. able yeah. to block any ships from entering the harbor. So Mehmet's like, well, I can't get through that. So why don't we just go around it? So in the middle of the night, his troops literally ferry their boats over land and then drop them in the water on the other side. The Byzantines wake up and they go, wait a second, I thought the chain was up. Where did where did these guys come from? And then they start to put two and two together. So he's a very, very bold commander. Like, you know, that's a huge, huge risk to have, you know, men carrying boats across land in the middle of the that's night hoping crazy. they don't get caught. Because like, then they get ambushed, they're toast. Like they're carrying these yep. boats, they're tired, they're weak, they're not armed pr- correctly. They're not wearing the right equipment. So yeah, it's, a, it's again, fortune favors the bold and that's, you know, a theme we've seen a lot yes, of sir. times. But there's a lot of small things that he does and and you know eventually i'm sure with some luck and eventually like you said you can only take bombardment for so long that they're able to find a way inside the city yeah and the siege continues and there's a couple of stories about how constantine instead of fleeing chose to to fight with his soldiers in regular armor apparently i don't know if it's like conclusive what happened to him afterwards but i think many historians just have concluded that you know during the kind of you know death thralls of constantinople before it fell that he was kind of lost in the chaos and decided ultimately not to flee but die as a martyr for the christian cause yeah, and we even see that too with justiniani who is the the defender that i think kind of historians say that's when everybody kind of knew the the battle was over was he's wounded mortally in battle and he's kind of taken away from the front lines and he was kind of that you know if constantine's the figurehead of you know their their leadership justiniani is their general he's the one who's they're looking for support and if people you know rumors going around did he die all that kind of stuff and we've talked about this before like nobody knows really what's going on within a battle especially if you're just a soldier fighting you hear rumors all these sort of things that creates some chaos and then you know the ottomans are able to break through and and take the city and kind of goes back to something we had talked about in previous episodes where you know they sack constantinople for you know three days and three nights as established by you know quote unquote international siege law where (laughs) you can loot a city for three days and three nights but that's about it. So the thing that Mehmet does as well is he wants to take and run this city. So he has to let his soldiers loot and do what you would do during a, a looting period of, of a city, which is <laughs> not good for anybody involved. But first thing that he does is he turns most of the churches into mosques. He looks yep. at ways to kind of repopulate the city because he wants us to be the capital of his empire. So it's not maybe a traditional siege where, you know, we're just coming in, looting everything that we want. And then whatever's left of the city is left. He has to try to give his soldiers a little bit, but make sure that these key landmarks that he wants to make, you know, the pinnacle of his empire aren't destroyed and are converted correctly into something that's more glorious to his Muslim faith. Yeah, and I think, again, that should probably just an element of how important this is, both symbolically and religiously and for his own personal ambition, right? He he wants to ensure that the plundering and the looting, you know, as far is as far it is as it is allowed and almost, you know, um, I guess accepted to a certain degree. Um, there are some guardrails he's putting around it to ensure that, you know, when he takes it over, that it's going to be in decent enough shape where he can kind of cement his legacy and, you know, evolve it from there. Yeah. And even afterwards, he actually goes throughout the empire and starts forcefully moving people from wherever they live into Constantinople <laughs> because he needs to repopulate this city, right? There's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes he sense. needs autumn, quote unquote, Ottoman people in this, in this city to make it this great city and kind of push out any of the remaining you know byzantine control but it does remain a multicultural city forever yeah yep. you know he, i saw somebody kind of say you know there, there's still christians there who are practicing their faith and all this sort of stuff but there was an understanding where look you can practice your faiths but you know don't don't be too much with it was kind of the way the, this person put it which i liked it was yeah. look go to church do your thing but we don't want to see big crosses being hung up we don't want to see you parading in the streets you know stay in your lane 
we're not going to bother you because we understand that there's some value in you know the stability that um, we don't you know we don't want to have this full on religious war and we, we want to be able to make this city a trade capital and it has to have some multicultural element to it in that sense but you know there's a little bit of a an understanding I think between the minority groups of of Constantinople and and Mehmet and the ruling class. Well, I think it's a tale as old as time, right? With this, the like when you're a conquering force, you don't want to absolutely, you know, I, I guess it's a fine balance. Like you want to be able to exert your control, authority and power over the people who have been conquered. But at the same time, you know, we see it with like the tale of empires, you still want to allow some degree of autonomy, religious freedom, you know, whatever it may be to ensure that, you know, the population that you're taking control of can still live in a way where they're not going to be so disgruntled that you have to worry about them 24 seven. For sure. And you want to also breed this cultural kind of legacy amongst the city. You want to build some, you want to bring art and culture and these sort of things into the city and to be too suppressive of certain things might kind of push that away. But then you don't want to have too much of it because then like to your point, you get a little bit of instability. So the city, I guess now is taken and and we've kind of chatted a little bit about kind of where Mehmet is is going with this, but I know we're, we're kind of wrapping up on the hour here um i wanted to just quickly go through why mehmet is known as the conqueror just real quick because this is just the beginning of his life his life goes on for a a long long time another i think 20 plus years um he was sultan for over 30 years so he took almost 13 different territories that people would say are considered pretty key so we know constantinople he takes a bunch of different places in greece he takes bosnia he takes albania he takes parts of serbia he takes genoese colonies within the black sea he takes the kingdom of wallachia which is romania today which we'll get into next week he takes more areas in turkey that had kind of been not fully under the ottoman control and then he takes a bunch of greek islands um, throughout the aegean sea to kind of really cement ottoman naval presence within that area so again 13 different territories over 30 years with constantinople the borders expanding significantly during his time makes sense to you know kind of be called the the conqueror <laughs> and there's and there's a couple other small things that he does that i thought was interesting so really quick we talked about how every time there's an ottoman succession change there's always a problem some, for mm-hmm. some reason, the brothers are fighting over things. And Mehmet's actually the first to start doing something that was kind of continued on in the Ottoman Empire for a long time is when a new sultan took power, their brothers, he would have all of the brothers and uncles and anybody who could be a threat, he would have them killed. So, wow. So there's a formal legalized practice of fracticide, it's called, or fratis- fracticide, in order to preserve the state and not further... Pl- not no further strain on the unity as previous symbol wars did. So Mehmet stated of any of my sons that ascend the throne, it is acceptable for him to kill his brothers for the common benefit of the people. The majority of Muslim scholars have approved this. Let this action be taken accordingly. So again, there's the Muslim element to it as well. It's not just a belief system. It's a legal system where it's like, look, we've checked with our Muslim scholars. We say this is okay because it's for the benefit of the people. Civil war is terrible. What's going to happen? Some have argued that this actually didn't really lead to peace and civil wars are breaking out anyway. So think, for example, if your brother takes power or is about to take power, you know that you're going to get a knife in your throat at some point. You might as well launch a civil war and try to take over because what do you have to lose? So it didn't really do, I think, what he thought it was going to do. But that's just kind of the way it went for the Ottomans for the longest time is brothers and uncles and all these sort of things fighting amongst each other to to take power. Essentially, that could potentially threaten throne uh, would get executed or killed. Exactly. Many of them probably under like duress of this potential reality we're like well let's just preemptively do something about it so exactly <laughs> what do i have yeah. to lose i'm already dead <laughs> exactly right you, you're gonna die anyways so yeah, you're yeah. essentially you have nothing to lose at this point Go so swinging. yeah but on top of that his in- impact and legacy i think cannot be understated with again a taking no. this great symbol expanding the ottoman empire but really giving the ottomans this level of legitimacy in the christian world that they started to have but it really changed it and brought it into another world where this is an absolute fear of the Christians as the Ottomans are going to continue to move into into Europe, which they continue to do for a few centuries. Um, you know, he's got mm-hmm. this incredible influence now on all of, really a lot of what Europeans are are trying to figure out from a political standpoint. And then he builds really this just great empire that has, like we said, this cultural and archaeological ar- architectural legacy. He's pushing through a lot of legal reforms, military, civil, that kind of stuff. So he's doing all the things that need to be done to really grow a great empire and really sets the seeds for some of the great all 
Ottoman sultans like Suleiman the Magnificent and some of these other folks who are going to come, you know, we'll talk about a shirts, I'm sure at some point. But I really do see Mehmet as maybe not the full transition point, but I think his father and Mehmet the first kind of started the Ottomans on this trajectory. And I think he's kind of pushed them into a different level um, mm-hmm. that really yep. sets the seeds for, you know, that final tier of Ottoman um, supremacy within this region. I would totally agree with that. I think um, you have to be able to, you know, uh, raise your glass to the work that was done by his father and grandfather to kind of provide that foundation. Obviously, if he inherited an empire that was, you know, ripping at the seams, he wouldn't been he would not have been able to accomplish, you know, the siege of Constantinople and the and the preceding victories that he did. But I think what he was handed and what he did with it uh, ultimately did kind of catapult, um, pun not intended, to um, kind of transform the Ottoman Empire into what it would be in the modern day. And I think it just goes to his like you know he's a bit of a visionary in in my mind just having done this episode you know he had he had grand goals he was extremely ambitious if if you learned anything about Mehmet in this episode I think the one thing that stands out to me was that his his ambition was you know exceedingly great and he was willing to do whatever it took to kind of meet his ambitious goals 100% and I I think you know if we talk about he was willing to do anything like you know, I don't, I don't want it to take away from the listeners that, you know, he was a great reformer. He did all of these things and, you know, was Mr. Nice Guy. He was very, very autocratic with his personality. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. my way or the highway a lot of times. But again, we've seen this in history where you have these great leaders who are very autocratic and, you know, are punishing those who resist the laws that he's put down. He's, you know, incredibly harsh and hard on people Mm -hmm. maybe more than he needs to be but we look at this time period with a little bit of instability and people telling him that you're not you know you're some kid you know the europeans are kind of laughing at you he's like okay well we'll see what's going to happen now and and i think he's very confident in himself kind of mixed with that ambition and we've there's this classical image of they call it the ottoman padisha which is the emperor right and was doing some reading and one of the historians said when you really think of that classical image of this sultan who's got ultimate power over his people commands his level of respect that no one had really seen before it really starts with Mehmet and that kind of grows throughout the Ottoman Empire so I think yeah he's autocratic yeah he's harsh but he got the job done and he set the Ottoman Empire up for the future so I think this is one of these things where maybe nice guys finish last in this sense just because of what was happening at that time where you really needed kind of that hard leader who is not going to take no for an answer and is going to be ridiculously ambitious but also understands what needs to be done to be able to be successful 100% and I think there's still those elements of like strategic and innovative insight you know just the way that he was able to strategize and actually siege constantinople or his innovative usage of of cannons or you know his building of fortresses or you know jumping the chain <laughs> to, to move his boat um even a degree uh, you know whatever degree you know we won't get into the numbers but like of religious inclusivity i think it's one of those opportunities where you look at historical leadership and ultimately you have to walk away with the reality that two things can be true at the same time which is you can be a ruthless autocratic leader but you know to expand and consolidate your empire you know much of that is needed but it's also kind of not necessarily balanced but it comes with other you know net positives that we usually associate with great leaders which is you know that kind of strategic innovative diplomatically astute uh you know willing to take calculated risks and i think he's someone who kind of fits the bill in that way definitely and i think he played the long game too right you you sir you look at someone like isabella and ferdinand who were just kicking everybody out of spain that wasn't wasn't catholic and then even when they did convert yeah. it was kind of like eh you're really not catholic where you know Mehmet's moving into traditionally christian and orthodox land he wants to convert them to islam He's, you know, stealing some kids and, and making them Janissaries. And there's obviously some pretty harsh things that are being done, but he needs to have some sort of religious tolerance yep. to slowly, you know, his goal is he wants everyone to be Muslim, but he's, you know, he sees it as a slow conversion over time. And I'm sure there's some forced conversions in there and those sort of things, but he can't just come in and, and kick everybody out just because they're not uh, following the same faith as you. So yeah, he definitely has to to bring in some of those things and, you know, it doesn't fall into maybe some of those tropes that we would expected where it's, you know, it's my way or the highway to a point. And again, I can only speak to his successes and assume that he's yep. doing the right things because if he wasn't able to accomplish some of those things, I don't think we'd be talking about him today. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Perfect. I think that's a great way to end. And um, yeah, everyone will be back again next week where we'll be talking about Vlad the Impaler. 
better known as Dracula, mm-hmm. who is actually one of Mehmet's fiercest foes. So we'll be talking about Mehmet again next week if you want to hear more about Mehmet, but we'll be bringing on a, another very interesting historical character from this time. So stay tuned for that and we'll see everybody next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the History in Motion podcast. If you enjoyed our journey through time, please subscribe, rate us, and share the podcast with friends. Your support helps keep history alive. Until next time.